So like I told you before, we're starting a new series. Last two weeks ago, I'm going to pick up um, on week two, but let's do a little bit of recap so we can remember where we are. So week one, I talked about the first church was in Ephesus. You're going to find this in the book of Revelation. And just so that we're all on the same page, the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And it's a letter to seven churches. The whole book is one letter. We go through chapters and verses, but the Bible wasn't wrote in chapters and verses. It was wrote as a letter. Later on, I believe it was around the 15th century, they put in chapters and verses to help us read it better and memorize scripture. So this is one letter wrote by the Apostle John who has been exiled on an island by himself, isolated. And I know a lot of times we think, oh man, that would be torture to be in the middle of an island and never be around anybody. And it probably would, but you know what? I'm beginning, Miss Velma, the more I read about John and I read this book of Revelation, the more I realize that the rest that this man got on that island opened his ears to hear God's secrets in a way he's never heard it before. And this man walked with Jesus for three years, was one of the 12 disciples. And God, Jesus himself, speaks to John to write this letter to seven churches, the whole book about the battles, about what it's like in heaven, about the rapture, the second coming, all that. He wrote that to seven churches and they passed it around one by one. And you notice, if you have it uh, in week one, the more we go, you're going to notice three things that Jesus addresses with these seven churches. The first thing he addresses is, is what you did well. The second thing he addresses is what you didn't do well, what you got wrong. And the third thing he does is tells them how to fix what they did wrong. You're going to see that with all these churches. And we're going to try to focus on that. And we're going to ask God each week that he ministers to us about our church as we look at one of these seven churches. Amen. So remember, it's one book and it's one letter to seven churches. I'm saying that because it has blew my mind that I didn't think of it that way. I thought that chapter one, two, and three was a letter. And then chapter four was talking about what it was like in heaven, what worship's like. If you want to know what it's like in heaven, read chapter four. And if you don't run and shout, you need Jesus. I just felt the wave hit me. He's faithful, church. Well, this week, we're going to talk about the second church. And uh, week one was the church in Ephesus. And this week, we're going to talk about the church in Smyrna. Smyrna, it's uh, S-M-Y-R-N-A. And this was the persecuted church. But God wanted them to remain faithful. It's the persecuted church that was faithful. And we don't really understand persecution because we don't live in a country that is heavily persecuted. The most persecution we deal with is if somebody says something about the clothes we had on. Or somebody blocks us on Facebook. And you know, there probably may be a little more like, you know, somebody persecutes you for the color of your skin. But you're not being cut in half. You're not being tied up to two horses and they take off and snatch you apart. Or sawed in half. For saying, Jesus is my Lord. So we're going to learn about this church today and how they were heavily persecuted 
and how God has a message for them. And we're going to learn how it's going to apply to us as well. Amen. So if we can, let's read uh, Revelation. We're going to read about this church. It's in Revelation chapter 2, and it's verses 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Mm. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Wow. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Mm. I'm excited to unpack this. <laughs> I want to ask a question. Is anybody going through a difficult time and you just don't know how to get out of it? You ever been there? Maybe you're there now. Maybe you're here now and you're like, I just don't know the answer. I've been crying out to God. I've been asking him. I've been been asking him. I don't know what the answer is. I don't hear him. I feel like I have the answer for you today. When you're going through a difficult season and you don't know what else to do, you don't know where else to turn, you're crying out and you don't hear nothing, I want you to do this and this will be your answer. You ready? Remember that God has been faithful. Remember, Patrick, he's been faithful to you every mountain you come across. He'd been faithful to me every time. In the moment, Chris, I thought I was going to be overwhelmed. But I look back, and he's been faithful. So when you find yourself in a moment like that again, just remember, man, God has been faithful to me. Um, I want to, there's so much in this, verses 8 through 11. I want to just try to unpack them line for line if we can today. We're going to dive in it and learn the scripture together. And uh, the first part I I want to get to is in verse 8 where it says, the first and the last. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. So let me kind of explain to you what he's saying here. Um, In the Greek, it actually reads Alpha Omega, which means I am the A- and the Z. That means he's the first, everything in between, and the last. That's what he says he is. Let me say it to you differently. I am everything that you have needed when the moment you come on this earth and I'll be everything you need to the moment you leave this earth. That's Uh, What I love about the Word of God is it always connects. You can just about, uh, don't don't, don't, uh, challenge me to it, but I'm pretty confident that you can read something in the New Testament and it'll be in the Old Testament in the same place somehow. Because our God's been saying the same thing since the beginning. Let me just show you. Remember the first and the last. This is Isaiah. This is almost 700 years before Jesus. Okay? Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. He's going to say it again. Let's go to uh, chapter 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, in Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And then in the book of Revelation, in the first chapter, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. 
what is Jesus saying? <laughs> Let me just use country talk for a second. You ready? Here's what he's saying. I ain't never not been faithful. I know that's a double negative, never not being, but that's how we talk down here, right? Yeah. But that's what he's saying. There ain't a time when I haven't been faithful. I was faithful in the beginning. I was faithful on the car rides. I was faithful on the ambulance ride. I was faithful when you was pushing the needle. I was faithful when you were cheating on your spouse. I was faithful when you were cursing me out, telling me I don't hear you. And I'll continue to be faithful. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Lord, get them. I pray the joy of the Lord hits all of you. Thank you, Lord. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever, and I heard somebody say this last week. This is why I put it down here. And I said, surely somebody else is in this place. I had somebody walk up to me and said, Pastor, I need to pray, I need to pray for him. I feel like my faith is running out. I've been fighting for so long. I just don't see a breakthrough. I'm getting weak and I just don't feel like I have no more faith. You ever been there? Yeah? I got good news. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Listen to this, verse 13. I took off and ran when I found this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. My God. He is saying, if you're running out of faith, that's all right, because I got it for you. And I can't deny it. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Jesus. He's saying, I can't deny being faithful to you. I mean, that'll destroy every lie Satan said to you about God. Well, God, I don't guess you're going to heal me. I can't deny it. I'm faithful. I said it. I'll do it. <laughs> the first and the last. Let's keep going down the verse. The next phrase. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Now, this is a very interesting phrase because this is exactly what the church in Smyrna will say. They were known for going around saying, we were dead, but now we're alive. So if you understand the history of Smyrna, they had a terrible economic collapse. They literally about folded up as a city. And they got together and they rebuilt it and they would look like they were dead, but now they're alive. They're thriving. And I find that very coincidental. Well, it's not really coincidental, but I find that very interesting that Jesus tells a church that's been going around bragging about, look what we did, that he says to them, no, I was dead, but now I'm alive. You don't know nothing about death. I'm the one that conquered it, not you. And I love that. Man, I love that. Um, and that's what he told them. He wanted them to know, hey, listen, stop your bragging. I was dead. And I'm alive. No other false God can say that. We're not hearing Muhammad say it. We're not hearing any other God, Buddha, any of them other gods. We're not hearing none of them. You know why? Because they're dead. They're not alive. Let's keep going. I know your poverty, but you are rich. This is so powerful. I know your poverty, but you are rich. Jesus is saying this to a church. So when I saw that, I was thinking poverty, poverty. Why? Like this church was 
economically and you know financially all that and then they come back so what, what do you mean they're poor so I looked this up in the Greek and you know what there's two words for it they have two different meanings and I find it very important that we understand which word is being used here because it changes the whole sentence so the, the two words um, <clears throat> are tukos and panakos Tukos and Panakis. Uh, this word poverty here is when he says, I know your poverty, but you are rich, is also the same word that we read in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus is on the sermon on the mount. In verse 3. We got that? Matthew 5, verse 3. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That word poor right there is tukos. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He didn't say who were poor in money. But blessed are the ones who are poor in their spirit. The other word, panakos, it means this. It means the working poor. Basically, your paycheck to paycheck. You can work, and you do work, but it's like Friday you get paid, and Tuesday you broke. And this is a week, 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 week thing. You do it week in and week out. The Bible would call that panakis poor. So what does two costs mean? Because we know that is not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying two costs. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means the begging poor, disabled, lame, cannot work. Um, here's what, here, let me give you a picture of what people who were two costs poor did. Most of these people were severely, they could be deformed, they could have leprosy, they could have a serious problem and a lot of them were ashamed. So they would cover themselves and they would hide in a dark place and they would stick a cup out of the dark because they didn't want nobody to see any part of them and they would shake it. And if nobody came and put a money or a coin in the cup, they would not eat. They wouldn't eat. It's the only way that they were able to provide for themselves. And if nobody put anything in the cup, they would starve. So why on earth would Jesus use this word with this understanding to this church in Smyrna? Here's why. Remember what the phrase is. I know your poverty, but you are rich. Jesus is talking about spiritual here. He's saying to these people, you are poor, disabled, lamed, and cannot work to get salvation. And you're just sticking your cup out begging for righteousness. And if I don't come and put something in your cup, you will die a spiritual death, a starvation. But be encouraged because I came and I put something in it and you're rich. That's what he's saying. Remember why Jesus would say this? Because he's faithful. He's faithful. Remember, guys, he's been faithful to us, right? We were all just like those people. We found ourselves in a broken place, have tried everything the world offered, and still there was an emptiness inside, and we couldn't do anything to fill the hole that was in our life. And from a dark place, we took a cup out and said, Lord, if you don't put something in this cup... I feel like I'm going to die. And he did. 
He came 2,000 years ago. He stretched his arms out on a piece of wood and they drove nine inch spikes through his hands and his feet. And he paid a price and saved every one of us. God is faithful. He's faithful. Um, I have two verses I want to give you to help you if you feel like you're in a trial because that's when the times we question is God with us, when we're being tempted, when we're going through hardships. That's when the enemy tells us God is nowhere in a 40-acre field. But I want you to know he's right with you. Let's pull up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Listen to this about his faithfulness. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Oh, say that again, baby. But God is faithful. One more time. But God is faithful. Did y'all hear him? Did y'all hear it? What is God? Go ahead. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Look how faithful our God is. He is faithful in the moment of temptation that he'll show you a way to get out. He's faithful. Look at James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life mm. which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He's faithful, church. God has been faithful. My point number two is this. God is faithful. Point number one was he has been faithful. Point number two is he is faithful. Now I want you to remember before I go to the, uh, keep going down these verses, I want you to remember that this is one letter wrote to seven churches. And when a church would get the letter, it says to the angel of the church. I don't know if you remember this or not, but that is the senior pastor. That's not talking about an angelic being. It's talking about the messenger for God, his mouthpiece, which is the senior pastor. He would be the one that would read the letter to the church. Now, I want you to think about this. A lot of people ask me this question. What's it like being the pastor of the church? I'm going to show you a small glimpse of what it's like. You ready? I want you to imagine, okay, just imagine that you have to stand up and read this to a congregation of people because Jesus told you to read it. You ready? Read this verse right here. Act like you're me and you have to read this to the people. Verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Imagine that. Imagine me having the responsibility to tell you, Miss Velma, they're going to come get you, and for ten days they're going to torture you. And then you're going to die. But stay faithful to God, sister. Yeah, you probably look at me. You done fell and bumped your head, pastor. That's what this pastor's had to do. Now, some of you heard the word 10 days. Well, at least they got 10 days. I can, you know, pray and ask God to save me in those 10 days. Let me tell you what the 10 days represent. This is common. You can look this up. What they were doing to the church in Smyrna is the Rome, Romans would get people who were claiming to be believers in Jesus and they wouldn't just kill them. For 10 days, they would take them and torture them to get them to renounce Jesus as Lord. For 10 days. And they suffered some of the most horrific tortures that you could ever imagine. You know, uh, a lot of people may not know this, but the greatest uh, torturers in, the, in our, our whole uh, history, 
gleaned from the Romans. Romans had terrible tortures. They say crucifixion is one of the worst torturous deaths you can experience. We're not talking about fingernails pulling off. We're talking about way worse things. And I don't want to be, I don't want to go as graphic with you, but you can just look it up for yourself how graphic and traumatizing our brothers and sisters were tortured. And they stayed faithful, church. They wouldn't renounce Jesus. Oh, I pray we get back to that. We'll deny Jesus quicker than we think about. We'll be around our buddies and we'll start talking or whatever. Hey, man, you want a quick hit? Hey, man, you want to hit this? And we'll deny him right there. We won't stand up for Jesus. When the world's coming at us, telling us, hey, accept our agendas, accept what we are, accept our lifestyles, we just quietly walk. These people weren't quiet. They stood up and said, Jesus is my Lord. I will not deny him. No matter how much pain you cause me, I will not deny him. And they were sold out. They were sold out. Uh, let's go back a verse. Look at verse 9. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, mm -hmm. but are a synagogue of Satan. Wow. I want to really focus on that right there, uh, a synagogue of Satan. Um, this word synagogue here is a Greek word, and it doesn't mean a building. It means a gathering of people. There's also another Greek word for it, um, and we may have heard this, and it's referring to the church, ecclesia. Ecclesia. Uh, in, uh, you know, this word is very similar to the, uh, the Spanish word of church, inglesia. Ecclesia, inglesia, it means the church, the gathering. It's not a building. Here's what I want you to know. We are the church. Not individually, but when we gather. We don't have to be in this building. We can be on the street. We can be at the house. We can be anywhere. But when we gather, that action of gathering is ecclesia. And what Jesus is saying here is, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, and you are rich. And I know the blasphemies that come from those who say that they are Jews and are not. Okay, now this is important because you need to understand why he is saying this. All right, here's why he's saying this. <clears throat> and I find this to be so powerful. He's saying this because there are Jews, ethnic Jews. They were born Jewish. And they were turning in fellow Jews to Rome and telling Rome, hey, these people are worshiping Jesus. Their own brothers and sisters, they were turning them in. And they were being tortured for 10 days and killed. And Jesus says this, they are Jews, excuse me, it says they are Jews, but they're not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. He's saying this church, He's saying to those people, I see every one of you that gathered to cause harm to my people. You're not for me, you're for Satan. And I see you. And when I thought about this, I couldn't help but think, oh my goodness, this is still happening today. We have people in the church who are claiming to be believers and will gather around a table and murder somebody with their words. Will slander another believer. 
And I want you to know this, that you are a gathering of Satan and not of the Lord when you do that. You are working for Satan and not the Lord. And I know that's very strong, but this is from Jesus. This ain't from me. This is what he's saying. This was happening all through the church. Let me show you Acts chapter 14, verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. 17.5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So this is not my physical house, by the way. In case you were wondering, did he put his name in there? No, I didn't. I know I got jokes, but I didn't do that. This is a real man. His name is Jason. And this is actually where my mom and dad got my name from. But let me tell you what this man does. This man was a faithful believer and he feared the Lord. And he would hide the Jews that were being persecuted in his house so that they wouldn't be killed. And other Jews found out about it and they turned him in and they set a riot off in the city and they attacked the house of Jason to get those people. Now, these are Jews doing this to Jews. And I thought about that and I said, you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of some things we see today. You know what? I want to ask this question. Was that the whole nation or, the, or was that all the Jews doing that or was that some? It was some of them, right? So should we hate all the Jews because of this action, Ms. Velma? But you know what's crazy? We do that in our culture. The injustice of some white people to black people and we now hate the whole race. Can I tell you that that's called racism? And let me take it a step further and tell you the definition of racism. You want to hear it from a, 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 a biblical standpoint? You ready? It's a synagogue of Satan. It's a gathering of people working for Satan and not God. That's what racism is. I just got one question and I'll move on from this part. What will it be for you? Will you be a synagogue for Satan or will you be a synagogue for the Lord? Just think about that when you're at work, when you're around your family especially when somebody ticks you off or hurts you. You have a moment right there. Am I going to just gather around somebody and find somebody to lick my wounds and destroy these people under the disguise? I care for them and just pray for them, but this is what they've done to me. You're a, you're a worker of Satan when you do that. I'm telling you, I have fell into this trap and I know it. Here's my last point. God will be faithful. God has been faithful. God is faithful. And God will be faithful. But not like you think. But not like you think. You see, we always want God to be faithful the way we've come up in our mind and determined for him to be faithful. God ain't going to be faithful like that, church. Do not be deceived. James, one of the 12 disciples, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And Rome is, is wreaking havoc. They're killing everybody who is professing Jesus. So they've arrested Peter. Peter is one of the 12 They've put him in jail and they're coming to get James. 
And James, we read, they attack him and throw him off the top of the church. And the fall paralyzes him, but it don't kill him. So they go out there and they take bats and beat him to death. Then simultaneously, Peter is released from prison. So I want to ask you a question. Was God not faithful to James, but faithful to Peter? One got released and the other one got threw off a building and beat to death. And they were both disciples. Was God faithful to one but not the other? Let's talk about another time of just genocide. How many knows who Corey Ten Boom is? She finds herself in a Nazi camp. She's a Jew, and they're eradicating them. They're, they, they're, 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 they're considered unclean people. They're going to eliminate them off the earth. And her and her sister try to escape, and her sister is killed, but she escapes. Was God faithful to her and not her sister? I'm asking you. Was he only faithful to one, but not the other? Remember what Jesus said? I am the first and I am the last. He's telling his church that I'm faithful even to death. That's what he's saying. He was faithful to James and he was faithful to Peter. He was faithful to Corey Tim Boom and he was faithful to her sister. But it didn't look the way we thought it was going to look. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, but I told you uh, week one who the pastor in the church of Ephesus was. It was Timothy. We know Timothy's got two books, two letters actually. Um, we also learn that he is the Apostle Paul's spiritual son. But he's also the pastor in the church in Ephesus, the Ephesian church. He's the pastor. Um, this church in Smyrna that we're talking about today, you know who the pastor of this church was? He was a man by the name of Polycarp. You know who his spiritual father was? John. John mentored him and helped put him in the position of the pastor of this church. The same John who was tortured and put into a pot of boiling water and would not stop preaching the gospel. And he wouldn't die. So the, so the Roman guy, the, uh, the uh, Pharaoh, whatever his name, not, not Pharaoh, the leader said, Get him out of here and put him on an island. If he's not going to be quiet, just put him where nobody is. So they put him on the island of Patmos. And Polycarp is his spiritual son. And he's this pastor of this church in Smyrna who's being persecuted. Let me tell you his story. It's fascinating. He was arrested. And for 10 days... They tortured him brutally. And they said, if you'll deny Christ, we'll stop it. And for 10 days, he would not stop. So after the 10 days was up, they took him and burnt him at the stake, alive. But guess what? He wouldn't die. Just like John, he wouldn't die. They said that he was preaching in the middle of a fire. And finally, a Roman guard ran up and took a spear and stuck it through his heart. 
And it said he literally bled out preaching the word of God. Look it up. It's in your history books. Look at the end. I want us to read the verse in the 10, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, Revelation. Look at what happens at the end. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life. Be faithful. Sean, they're going to kill you, but I want you to be faithful. And if you're faithful, Sean, I'll give you the crown of life. Now, when I read this, I have always saw in my head a royal crown. Kingly. Because God is our king and he wants to give us a royal crown. Until I looked it up and I realized this is not the word for a royal crown. The word is Stephanos. Stephanos is a Greek word meaning wreath. And here's what it was given to. It was given to the Roman athletes who would win a race or the Olympic trials. If they would win, they would give them a wreath. You can look in your history books and you'll see Caesar and all them and they're wearing the wreath around their head. It's a sign of victory that they have won. So Jesus uses this word, not a royal crown, but a wreath. And what is he saying? Jesus is saying, you're not going to get a royal crown, but you're going to get a wreath because it's a sign that you finished the race of faith. You stayed faithful. And all of heaven will know that you were victorious and you won the race. You know what I find so powerful? You know this word is used one more time in Scripture? You know where it's used? 2 Timothy, verses 4, 6 through 8. And this is the Apostle Paul's recorded some of his last words he says before he dies. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Listen. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, there it is. which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's good news. The Apostle Paul said, I'm going to get a wreath of victory because I fought the fight. I ran the race and I stayed faithful. And you know what else is good? All of you others who do the same thing, God's got one waiting for you too. That's encouraging. I want to have one of those wreaths. I want to see all my brothers and sisters in heaven with one of those wreaths. Because we are victorious, church. Jesus has been faithful to us. He is faithful to us. And He will continue to be faithful to us. I want to close uh, with uh, something very personal. A lot of you know about, but October of this year was a very challenging time for my family. Actually, this whole year has been challenging for my family. But October the 2nd, around 8.30 at night, after our staff meeting, our staff gets together on Monday nights, um, my brother and myself, along with another one of our uh, young men in our church, went to go pick a car up because uh, they needed a vehicle. Their car broke down. So I go over to my other brother's house to get it. Um, it was Amanda's first car she ever bought. We uh, just had it parked. We didn't need it. And we were going to get it, and it had been sitting for a while. So the battery was dead. Well, I jump it off, and uh, I take off running uh, in it, you know, getting trying to get it, you know, juiced back up. And... Uh, 
as I'm going, it's just, it's dying. I'm like, oh, we're finna break down. So uh, I get to the red light uh, out here in the middle of Prattville, and I turn on Jasmine Trail Road, and the car dies. So I pull it off to the curb on the side of the road, and uh, we go to uh, use my jump box to jump it off, and the jump box won't jump it. So we went back to my house, which was a few streets over, and we got the jumper cables, and we come back in my wife's van, my brother and I, and we pulled the van up nose to nose, like we're gonna jump the car off. And uh, my brother and I were there, and Corey's in between the two vehicles, and I'm also in between them, but I'm turned sideways. He's facing them, in between them. And as we're talking about hooking the jumper cables up, a young kid, um, doing 45 miles an hour, smacked the back of the car and pinned us in between the two vehicles. It knocked me on the ground and it sandwiched core in between the two vehicles. Well, as horrific as that is to see and to hear the screams of my brother, I look down and there's blood everywhere. And all I can hear is my baby brother crying out to me, Jason, my legs are broke, help me. And my whole life, I'm, I'm the big brother. I have always been able to come to the rescue and help. And I look over as I, I had to pull my brother up off the ground. And all I kept hearing, I looked down, there's blood everywhere. And I didn't know, but his main femur or his bone had come out and hit the main artery in his leg. And I see my brother and he looks at me and man, it's, it's quick. And he's like, hey man, just tell my girl I love her, take care of her, tell everybody I love them. I'm dying, I'm dying. And in the moment, I just zoned out. I wasn't panicking, but I knew I'm about to watch my baby brother die right here in my arms. And he was looking at me and I saw his eyes roll back and then he was gone. He just went out. Whole face went pale white. And I'm shaking him and shaking him, telling him to come back. And if God is my witness, I heard the sweet whisper of the Lord say to me, remember, Jason, I have always been faithful. And on the side of that road, I cry out in Jesus name, you come back to life. You're not leaving us now. Well, the, the police officer got there at that time as I'm screaming, and he says, move out the way, move out the way. He turned it to my brother's leg, and then all of a sudden, my brother just opened his eyes. And they get him in the ambulance, they cut his leg off. You can see the bone hanging out the side of his leg. Legs mangled. We get him to the hospital, they're like, man, you're never gonna walk again, man. Your legs are crushed. I call my pastor. And my pastor immediately just starts praying, I command the bones to come back into alignment. And he says these words, God, I know you're faithful. From the time I got myself together, they wanted me to write a whole, uh, fill out a whole piece of uh, paper of what happened. And I, I, in my mind, I couldn't even think about that. I'm thinking about getting to the hospital to make sure my brother's okay. Well, I finally get that paper filled out and we head up there. And from the time I talk to my pastor and I get to the hospital, miraculously, Corey's bones had come back into alignment. He got caught, it was called in massive trauma to the legs with bones protruding. We get to the hospital, they got him in the big trauma room one and they can't find a broke bone in his body. And he's standing right back there in the back right now on those two legs.
And I say all that to say this, and here comes that double negative sentence again. There has never been a time God has not been faithful. Never. A year ago, we had to sit my mother down and look her in the face and say, you need help, you're addicted to drugs, and you can't be a part of this family in this season, and we have to let you go. Most difficult time I think I ever watched my father go through, and we had to send my mom off. And it's been a long year. My mom was a very selfish person, very narcissistic, only thought of herself. When she come in the house, the whole house had to stop and do what she wanted. And for a whole year, my mother's been gone. And I can tell you this, over the last month, I have started reaching back out to my mom and talking with her. And she sounds like a different person. She's talking about how faithful God has been to her how he exposed the lies of Satan. And you know what? We're going to go get my mama next weekend and she's going to come to church with us on Sunday. And it will be a prayer answered and it'll be a confirmation that God has been, is, and will be faithful. I want to close with everybody bowing their head. And I want you to ask yourself this question. God, how does this message apply to me today?